Okay, we'd like to continue with our discussion of continuity, and I'm going to kind of go back and recap the definition that we had for continuous at a point, which is, remember that there were three parts to it, that if you were trying to determine if a function is continuous at a point, then you have to first discuss or show that f of c is defined, in other words, that there is a y value for the x value of c. You had to show that the limit as x approaches c of the function existed. Now remember that with this one, you have to always discuss both the left and the right limit. So you have to figure out that the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x has to exist. The limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x has to exist, and they have to be equal to each other. So that is one of the things that when you're discussing this, you have to always make sure you mention the left and the right. And then the third part, a very important part that you must have in order to be continuous at a point, is the limit as x approaches c of f of x has to be the same value as what you got when you plugged in c into the function and got your function value. And you have to make sure that all three of these conditions are met. Now I want to add to our definition of continuity what it means to be continuous on an open interval, a closed interval, and then everywhere. All right, on an open interval, which basically says everywhere except the endpoints, it's fairly straightforward. It has to be continuous at every point in the interval. So you just disregard the endpoints and just look at all the points in between. The function is continuous on a closed interval. It kind of gives you a, an extra caveat that must be met. It has to be continuous in the open interval, so at every point in the open interval from A to B. And then it's going to discuss that the limit as x approaches A from the right, because A is the lower bound. So if I approach A from the right, it has to be f of A. And then if I approach B from the left, because B is the upper bound, it has to be f of B. In other words, it has to be continuous at the endpoints. Uh, we don't worry about the right side of B, because that wouldn't be in the interval. And we don't worry about the left side of A, because that wouldn't be in the interval from A to B. So we only care about what happens at A and B, and then what happens in between. Um, and make sure you realize this does mean that f of A and f of B have to be defined in order to be continuous on the closed interval. And then we have our nice continuous everywhere, which is basically it's continuous from negative infinity to infinity, which would be functions like e to the x, cosine and sine of x, any polynomial, um, let's see, uh, y equals x squared, they're all linear functions that have a slope that is not undefined, and so on. So that would kind of give you this idea of what types of functions we're going to be talking about there. Alright, so this next little section I'm going to let you do a little work and pause the video. What I'd like you to do is think about the types of discontinuities that could occur at a point. Uh, the three types of discontinuities that can occur at a point would be a point discontinuity, an infinite discontinuity, and then a jump discontinuity. Uh, the one that I'm not kind of discussing here is the regional discontinuity, like for a square root, it's not defined for a whole section of x values. I'm more concerned with discontinuities that occur at a point, of which you can have the point, an infinite, or jump. So what I want you to do is take a look. I've given you, I'm using the definition of continuity, the three conditions. I'm giving you what's true. And I want you to tell me, based on that information, what kind of discontinuity occurs, point, infinite, or jump, and then draw a sketch that kind of illustrates what's going on in that situation. All right, so I'm going to pause the video. I want you to take the time and try these on your own, and then come back and start the video. Okay, so if you're ready to come back, let's discuss each of these and kind of talk about the picture that you're going to have. You know, they do have this thing where they give you some um, multiple choice or things like that, some matching, where they're going to give you some pieces of information. And you either have to choose which of the conditions is met by the graph, or you have to sketch a graph that meets the condition. So that's why we're kind of taking a look at this. So here's our first two. Both of them are point discontinuities. One of the most common mistakes I see is that people, because they think, hey, I'm coming along and I jump up here, they want to call this a jump. But if it's only a single value that the left and the limit, if the limit on the left and the limit on the right equal each other, it is always going to be a point discontinuity, regardless of whether f of c exists or doesn't exist. All right. If we take a look at the next two, 
these are our examples of our jump discontinuities. And the reason, the part that makes it a jump is because the limit on the left and the limit on the right are not the same. It doesn't really matter where, whether f of c is defined or not. That's not what's making it the jump. What's making it the jump is that the left and the right limit are not the same. Whereas what makes it a point discontinuity is the left and the right are the same, but they're not the same as f of c. That is, either it doesn't exist or it's somewhere else. So down here, I did three examples. One where the f of c worked with the right-hand limit, one where it works with the left-hand limit, and then one where it's not even in the same place at all. So all of these would still be considered jump discontinuities, and then this one where you don't have f of c, it doesn't exist, uh, you would have that as a jump discontinuity as well. Okay, and then flipping over to our last two pieces over here. Whenever you have the left or the right-hand limits going to plus or minus infinity, it is always an infinite discontinuity. So it doesn't really matter whether the function is undefined or defined, it's still going to be an infinite discontinuity. And you're like, well, when does this ever happen? When do I have an actual point on the asymptote? And the answer is usually it's some kind of a weird piecewise function where, you know, like the simplest example might be something like f of x equals 1 over x if x does not equal 0 and 5 if x equals 0. I mean, so you can make up some kind of cheesy example like that. But it, it's still considered an infinite discontinuity because the left or the right-hand limit is going to go up to infinity or down to negative infinity. All right, now part of what you're going to be doing a lot of times in AP Calculus and especially on the test, you're going to have to make a statement about functions and whether or not functions are continuous. There are going to be a multitude of theorems which have a condition that says that f of x must be continuous which means that for you to invoke the theorem or use the theorem in a free response question, you have to make a statement about the function being continuous or show that it's continuous. So now there are going to be some functions that you don't have to do any proof for, that you essentially can say f of x is a polynomial, therefore it is continuous. Like, it's like we take that as known facts, so you don't have to do any work for it. Now the polynomial, pretty straightforward. Rational, as long as your denominator, like if you had r of x equal to a polynomial p of x divided by q of x, that's only as long as q of x does not equal 0. Okay? If q of x equals 0, you don't even have to really worry about it because notice it says in their domain. So this would be one of those things where this one is continuous everywhere. because their domain is negative infinity to infinity. This would be continuous everywhere that q of x doesn't equal 0. So that's the in their domain part. If q of x was equal to 0, that value is not in the domain. It's not continuous at that point. It's not continuous everywhere, but it's continuous everywhere else except for what makes q of x 0. Where are you going to see this? The problem that you're dealing with might be on an interval from 0 to infinity. Your q of x may equal 0 for, say, x equal to negative 3. But that's not in the interval the problem is considering, so you don't have to do any proof. You just simply say uh, r of x is continuous on the interval 0 to infinity since q of x does not equal 0 for any x in that interval. So you can go ahead and you can get statements and make statements about the continuity of a function as long as you are discussing points in their domain. Same thing, radicals. Odd radicals are continuous everywhere. Even radicals are continuous on their domain, typically 0 to infinity or for some set of values that make the radicand positive. Your trigonometric functions, as long as it's not where a vertical asymptote would occur, say on a tangent, a secant, a cosecant, or a cotangent, then it would be continuous in the section that is not the vertical asymptotes. Exponentials are continuous everywhere. Logarithmic continuous on their domain. Remember, their domain typically is 0 to infinity or anything that when you are taking the log of it, you can't take the log of a negative number um, and you can't take the log of 0. So any non-negative, non-zero number that you can take the log of. Like for example, if I had the log of x plus 2, this would be continuous from negative 2 up, but not including negative 2 because its domain 
is negative 2 to infinity because that's what makes the inside part or the input to the laws positive. All right, a couple properties of continuity that you get from this. In other words, we still get to kind of build on the basic functions that we know are continuous. All right, so we're given f and g are going to be continuous on their domain. k is a constant. And then we want to know what about h of x? Is that also going to be continuous? Well, if I take, say, h of x, and it's simply going to be a constant times f of x, then clearly that's going to be a continuous function. Stretching or shrinking a graph vertically does not change where it is continuous. It will be continuous on the same domain as f of x because multiplying by scalar does not change the domain of a function. We also know that if I take your function h of x and I say it's equal to either f of x plus g of x or minus g of x, the summer difference of continuous functions is continuous. Um, it will be undefined in exactly the same place. It will be a combination, if you remember your domain of the composition, so the domain of f plus or minus g is the intersection of the two domains. So when you do the intersection of this, it's still talking about continuous on its domain, it's continuous wherever both f and g are continuous. Okay, product, same reasoning, h of x equals f of x times g of x, h is continuous as long as f and g are continuous. Your quotient, if h of x equals f of x divided by g of x, as long as g of x does not equal zero, then it's continuous on the domains. Now, of course, if it is g of x doesn't equal zero for some x value that's in the original domain of here, then you would have to throw that out. There would be an additional problem that you would have where it's not continuous. And then composition. Now composition is the one that you have to be a little careful with when we talk about it. Now with composition, what we're going to say is, we're going to say if g of x is continuous at x equal to c, okay, so we've got this value c, it's in the domain of g of x, so it's continuous. And, but now remember, when you do composition, we're basically talking about h of x equals f of g of x. So your input into g is c. So you're going to do g of c. But what's your input into f? It's the output of g of c. So what we're going to say is f of x has to be continuous. at x equal to g of c, because your output, you put in c, you calculate g of c, that's the input into f. So f has to be continuous at that value. And if it's true, if those two things are true, g has to be continuous at c, and then f has to be continuous at g of c, then f of g of x, <coughs> excuse me, is continuous at c2. Alright, so that's got an extra little step in it, but that kind of goes over our combinations of functions um, that we talked before. Now, anything beyond that, you are going to have to basically do a proof of showing that the function is continuous. And I'm going to tell you, and I've put this in yellow, there will be a free response question where there's one part of it where you're going to have to determine or discuss the continuity of the function. And they're very straightforward, and they have the same format. In order to receive credit and to get all the possible points for the question, you have to make sure that you address all three conditions and state a conclusion. And the idea, one of the things that I want to add in here, is you have to show supporting evidence from the problem. In other words, they don't want you to just restate the three conditions and then say, therefore, f of x is continuous. They want you to state that f of c exists, which is the first part, but you have to actually give its value from the problem. You have to say, oh, well, f of c actually is 5, or whatever it's going to be from the problem. You have to show that the limit, or state that the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists. But in order to do this, what you really have to do is, from the problem, show what the limit from the left is, show what the limit from the right is, and show that they're equal to each other. So you actually have to have work, 
or discussions using the given information in the problem to show the left and the right hand limits are the same. And then your concluding statement, it, you kind of can wrap up the first two parts and the third part together. Because once you get these two done, you really are just making a concluding statement. You're going to say, we know f of c exists, and you know the value. You know the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists. And then you just need to say, and they are equal to each other. That's the third part of the conditions that must be met. And actually give whatever value it is from the problem. Then you get to make your conclusion. Make sure that you state somewhere in English. This, I mean, you pretty much just copy this down. And you always, at the very end of a free response part, where you're trying to show continuity, since f of c exists, the limit exists, and they're equal to each other, then you have to just make that statement. And that will guarantee that you'll get the full credit for that part. All right, so let's come down here. Let's just kind of show you an example of what we're looking at. So first thing I do is I come along, and I want to show that this is continuous at x equal to 2. So I'm at a point. So I say, OK. The first thing I'm going to discuss is f of 2. Um, f of 2 exists because what is f of 2 in this problem? When x is equal to 2, you're in this part of the graph, so it's 4. f of 2 equals 4. Okay, done with the first part. I move to the second part. The second part says I have to talk about the limit. Now, since you have to do the left and the right, and it's piecewise, you just pretty much always start out with the left and the right limit. I would say the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x. And then typically in your piecewise, what you're going to do is you're going to go find the left piece. Now, the left piece, and this is actually a little different because it's not an inequality here, the left and the right piece are actually going to be the same. The left piece, when you're left of 2, you're going to use x squared. When you're right of 2, you're going to use x squared. The only time you're not going to use x squared is when you are 2, and we don't care about that. So the limit as you approach 2 from the left of f of x equals the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of x squared, which is 4. And then, then do the same thing for the right. The limit as x approaches 2 from the right of f of x is the limit as x approaches 2 from the left, uh, right of x squared, use the piece, which equals 4. So the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x exists since the limit as x approaches 2 from the left equals the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of f of x. Alright, and then we go down to our third part, which is our final condition and our conclusion. So since f of 2 exists, the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x exists, and f of 2 equals the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x, which equals 4, then f is continuous at x equal to 2. Those are all the parts that must be there in order for you to receive full credit. Usually what happens is they kind of have this part where you know, it might be like three points for this. You get one point for stating f of 2 exists. You get one point for not only saying the limit exists, but you have to say or discuss the left and the right limit. And then you get the third point for your conclusion, which must include some statement saying that the f of 2 equals the limit as x approaches 2. I mean, I can't get any more. It's like a formula that you're going to do. You're going to see it. It's going to be a free response question, and you need to have all three of these parts. So you do want to make sure you kind of go through each of these parts. All right, so I'm going to come down here. Here's example number two, another piecewise. I would like you to pause the video, and I would like you to go through one, two, three parts and write it up, and then we'll kind of come together, and then you'll check and see if I would have given you the full credit. Now, one comment before I let you get started on this. Make sure that you are using good mathematical communication because this is something that you're going to hear us saying over and over and over again. 
do not write a limit without putting a function value as its input. Okay, if you don't have f of x written here, if you just have limit as x approaches 2 from the right, and there's nothing written there, they will not give you credit for it because you have poor mathematical communication. You have to make sure that you are writing in correct mathematical English is what they're looking for. So you have to have clear communication of the ideas that you're looking at. Alright, so pause the video and go ahead and work example two. Alright, so let's come back together and you may think I tricked you on this one, but even if the function is not continuous, you are always going to need to justify why. You're not just going to be allowed to say, hey, it's not continuous. So you still have to address the three parts. So the first part is f of negative 1, it exists, so that was fine, a little short statement. But then when you go to do your left and your right limit, what you should notice is that your left and your right limits are not the same. And if your left and your right limits are not the same, then of course the limit as x approaches negative 1 does not exist. So you have to still show the left and the right limit. Now your concluding statement is going to be a little bit different. Because we're not concluding that it is continuous, we're concluding that it is not continuous and then tell me which of the properties is violated and in this case it was violated because the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x does not exist. Now even if it violates more than one of the properties you only really have to state one because once one condition is not met you don't really care about the others. Uh, but you do need to kind of show the work for why the condition was not met and then make a concluding statement. Alright, so let's take a look at example three. And again, I'm going to let you do a little bit of work before we come together. So what I want you to do, we're looking at the open interval from zero to three. So from here over to here. And we want to discuss and name any points of discontinuity. Now remember, since it's an open interval, we're only looking at the points in between. We're not considering zero and three. We don't care about what's happening there. And just in case, if you can't make sure you read it, this is going to be an open circle right here. And I can go ahead and make mine a little bit more obvious for you. And then this right here is also an open circle so that you can see kind of where the points are defined and so on. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video, let you name any points of discontinuity, and discuss. Now, tell me what the conditions are. This goes back to the very first example that we had. Tell me what the conditions are and why it's not, why it is discontinuous there. So I'm going to pause, give you a moment work the problem, and then come back. Okay, let's come back together. Our first point of discontinuity happens at x equal to 1. And so I would really just started with my concluding statement, and you make sure you discuss all the parts. But the main reason that f of x is not continuous at x equal to 1 is because the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x does not equal f of 1, the value at x equal to 1. Um, what kind of a discontinuity is it? It is a point discontinuity. Because, and then here's where I've made sure, you notice I didn't actually put it in order in this one. And that's fine for the AP. They're still just going to read through what you have. And they're going to say, did they discuss whether or not f of 1 existed? Which I did right here. Did you discuss whether the limit existed? The answer is yes, you did right here. Now I don't need to do a lot of work for this one and maybe discuss the left and the right because it's a picture and it's clear and obvious from the picture. And then the third thing is that the function value did not equal the limit, and so that was what we had. And that's also our classic description of what is a point discontinuity. Okay, so I'll let you go back, uh, pause it again if you need to, revisit your next one, see what you want to say for that. All right, and so here's my statement about number two, that the function is not continuous at x equal to two because the limit as x approaches two of f of x does not exist. Now, why does it exist? I went ahead and went a little bit further and said there is a jump discontinuity, the type, because the limit from the left is 1, but the limit from the right is 3. And notice that what I'm doing here is I'm pulling information from the problem so that they can you get credit for understanding why this is a jump discontinuity, and you have illustrated to the reader that you understand why this is jump discontinuity. All right, now let's take a look at the next example together. This is a very classic free response type question, and sometimes you'll even see it in the multiple choice, where what you're given is a piecewise function where you have some parameter. In this case, we have this a. 
which is going to be a real number that is kind of like your job is to determine what that value is that will make the function continuous. And you really are still going through the three steps, uh, but what you want to do is you're going to have to try to use the three steps that are required for it to be continuous to help you figure out what that value of A is. So kind of the first thing, we're going to go through the steps. The first thing I'm going to do is I need to make sure that f of negative 1 exists. And it exists if f of negative 1, now where you're equal to negative 1, you're on this piece, you would have to actually equal a times negative 1 squared plus 1, and usually you simplify it a little bit, which is basically a plus 1. So as long as there is a real value a, this is going to be when you exist. Now, whatever a value you pick has to make this work out to be an actual value which pretty much any real number is going to work. So that doesn't really help us too much yet, but we're going to use this piece a little bit later. All right. Now, the second thing is, is we look at the limits. So I want to look at the limit as x approaches negative 1, and I'm going to use the piece that doesn't have an a in it to start with. So that's from the left of f of x. And so that's going to be the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left is going to be this 4 minus x squared because that's the piece on the left. And since that's a polynomial, we know that we can calculate a limit, whether we're doing left or right, doesn't matter, by using direct substitution. So that's going to equal 4 minus negative 1 squared, 4 minus 1, or 3. So right there, we know that the left limit is 3. And then that's from using the piece that doesn't have a. Then I write down the right limit. The limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right of f of x. In that case, you're going to be using the right piece, which is now this ax squared plus 1. And I know it's tedious, but make sure you're using good mathematical communication, writing your limits down each time. Now again, a is a real number. A real number, a scalar multiple times a power function, which is continuous, is continuous. And adding another value to it is still continuous. So we know this is continuous, so I can use direct substitution. By direct substitution, negative 1 squared plus 1, which would equal a plus 1. Now, here's where you can start answering what the value of a is. For the limit, as x approaches negative 1 of f of x to exist, then your limit, as x approaches 1 from the left, has to equal the limit as x approaches 1 from the right. And I'm doing negative 1, so add in your negatives right there. When is that true? When is the left limit equal to the right limit? This is when 3 equals a plus 1. Therefore, a equal to 2 means the limit exists. Now, at this point, I'm going to come back up here to this. And kind of now that I've decided that my a is equal to 2, I'm going to justify that my f of negative 1 exists. This makes f of negative 1 equal to a plus 1 equal to 2 plus 1 equal to 3. So that way I can kind of go back and figure out what my f of negative 1 is, because I need that for my final part of this, which is part 3, is your concluding statement. f of x is continuous at x equal to negative 1 when a equals 2, since f of negative 1 equals the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x, which equals 3, and f of negative 1 and the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x existed. Now technically I should have done the existed before I did the final version, but they don't care about that as long as you have said it. So the idea is, is that you kind of use the information that you have. Now, notice initially I didn't have any choice of what A was. 
but I went ahead and went to the second condition and in the second condition it kind of fell out what A was going to be but I did go back and address the first condition again to make sure I finalized it so I got the first and the second condition met so that I could make my concluding statement and show the function value is equal to the limit value which was 3. Okay, So that gives you a good example for and like I said, this is the classic type of problem that you're going to see on the AP, where you have to actually determine what this value is. Alright, so I'm going to let you try example 5 on your own, and then come back together. So pause it, discuss, you want to now notice in this one, this is a little bit harder. You have to find values of A, and you have to find values of B. But again, my hint is I want you to go through the three conditions, and then use what you find out from those conditions in order to determine what A and B are. Okay, let's come back together and talk about what our conclusions are from this one. It was a little bit harder because we had the two parameters that we had to find. But the first part was easy. F of 1 existed and it was 2. because That's straight from this middle piece right here. Then I went to the second condition, which is the left and the right limits. The left limit uses the piece x squared plus x plus A. Once I got to here, this is a continuous function because you have a polynomial since a is a real number. I can do direct substitution. I got a plus 2 to the left limit. The right limit, I use the piece bx cubed, which again is a polynomial, so I can substitute the 1 in, use direct substitution, I get b. Now at this point, you can't really finish this one out because what we know is that it would be continuous as long as the limit exists, and the limit only exists when the left and the right are equal, which would mean a plus 2 has to equal b. So it gave me a piece of information that I can use, but it is not something that actually gave me the values of a and b. Now, here's the third part is where you're going to be able to find the values of a and b. For the function to be continuous at x equal to 1, f of 1 and the limit must exist and be equal to each other. So I'm just kind of reminding you what's going on there. I know f of 1 is 2, and so I know the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x has to be the same as f of 1, so it has to be 2. But that also means that the left and the right limit have to be 2. So this is going to be the actual key that gets you your a and b. The left limit was a plus 2, which would mean a is 0, and the right limit was b, so b is equal to 2. So that gives us a value of 0 for a and 2 for b. And then make sure that you write your concluding sentence at the end of it. This is kind of the wrap it up statement that we have down here at the end. And that wrap it up statement is saying that it's continuous at x equal to 1. Here are the two values that you found. You found that a was 0 and b was 2. The reason that it's continuous, make your three statements. f of 1 equals 2, it existed. Your limit existed since the left and the right limit were 2. And the function value was the limit value, which was 2. So we get those three parts in there to make sure that we have all the sections that we need. Right? And what I'm going to do now, our example 6 here, talks about the whether the function is continuous on the indicated interval. So now what I want you to do is go back and review. There was the definition for continuous on an open interval that I gave you at the beginning and a definition for continuous on a closed interval that I gave you at the beginning. So go back, review those definitions, and then come back to this, and I want you to work each of these problems and kind of come back and we'll discuss in class next time. This one I think is pretty straightforward. I mean, like, I'll do one for you, and then we'll just discuss it in class. Like, I have negative 5 to 2. So in my picture, here's negative 5 to negative 2, which is this value right here. And it's an open interval. So I don't care what's happening on the endpoints. I only care what's happening in between. And in between, is it continuous at every point? The answer is yes. So this one would be yes, it is continuous on the open interval from negative 5 to 2. Uh, let's do one now, you know, throwing this in, the fact that you have a half-open, half-closed interval, well, that just means, like here, if I take the definition on a closed interval, I don't really care about what's happening at this endpoint, but I do care about what's happening at this endpoint. So over here, the negative 5 does not bother me. So I'm coming in, 
up to here. What bothers me is what's happening at negative 2. Is it continuous at negative 2? The answer is no, because you have an infinite discontinuity because of this. It doesn't matter that it's actually defined and there's a point there. It is still not continuous because of the infinite discontinuity at x equal to negative 2. So this is no, and that would be because the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left of f of x equals infinity, which does not exist. Okay, So we have the left-hand limit of that upper bound does not exist, so that throws it out. That's from your definition of closed intervals. Whereas over here in C, this one would be yes, because the lower limit, we only care about this side, the limit as x approaches negative 5 from the right, well, that one exists. I don't care what's happening over here at negative 2, and everything else in between is continuous, so this will be a yes. Okay, so I'm going to leave the rest of these for you to finish, and we will discuss uh, D, E, F, and G in, in class next time. Right, and you'll also go ahead and try H and I, again, based on the definition of open and closed intervals and continuity on those intervals. All right, let's look at the composite function. Uh, I'll kind of put those separate because that's a little bit different. Uh, a function is continuous uh, for the composition if the inside function is continuous at C, and the outside function is continuous at whatever the y value that you got after you plug c in is. So like down here, for example, let's take a look at h of x. Your inside function, um, we want to describe where the following functions are continuous. Well, this one's pretty straightforward, because what do we know about x squared? It's kind of like if we do this as f of g of x, our g of x, the inside function, is x squared. What do we know about x squared? It's continuous everywhere. Okay, And then what do we know about our outside function f of x? f of x is equal to sine of x, which is also continuous everywhere. So in looking at this one, we say, well, what do we know about this composition? Is it going to be continuous? Well, the answer is yes because I can take every x and plug it into x squared, and so g, according to our little definition up here, will be continuous at all values of c. And then whatever we get out, your output from that, which is basically going to be 0 to infinity, is that going to be something that f is continuous on? And yeah, f is going to be continuous on 0 to infinity because it's continuous everywhere too. So clearly, the composite of two continuous everywhere functions is continuous everywhere. All right, let's take a look at our next example. All right, so now in this one, let's look at our inside function. If I was decomposing this, that's what that's called. So if I said h of x was equal to f of g of x, then my g of x is going to be the function cosine of x plus 1. And my outside function f, f of x, is going to be the natural log of x. Okay. So now this one's a little bit more complicated. The first part is okay. The question is, with this inside function, when is cosine of x plus 1, for what values is this continuous? This is continuous everywhere. Okay, Because the fact that this is continuous everywhere is because you have a continuous function that's continuous everywhere plus a constant plus 1. So two continuous functions added together give you a continuous function. But then we come into a problem, because now we come down here and we have this ln of x. Now, ln of x is only continuous on its domain. And it's only continuous, its domain is everything from 0 to infinity. So what that tells us is that this is only continuous 
when its input, which is g of x, is greater than 0. And so we have to do a little work on this. When is the g of x greater than 0? So let's take a look at, let's think about what that function looks like. g of x is equal to cosine of x plus 1, which is nothing more than your cosine graph shifted up 1. So let's do a little visual here. Your cosine graph usually starts at 1 and goes max, intercept, min, intercept, max. But I shifted it up 1, which means that my max is now going to be at 2. And it's going to come down, touch, and come up. And your midline is going to be here at 1. So it's really positive everywhere in this first period except at this value right here. And what value is that? This, remember, is 0. And then it's the intercept in pi over 2. And then this would be at pi. Now, continuing your pattern, kind of thinking about what's happening here. Um, the only problem you really have is when g of x is equal to 0. So I can, let's do this algebraically. When is cosine of x plus 1 equal to 0? When cosine of x equals negative 1, when is cosine of x equal to negative 1? It's equal to negative 1 at pi. When does it happen again? Exactly one period later, plus 2 pi k. So the question that we had in this was, where are the following functions continuous? The following functions are continuous at all the x values. So h of x, which colors are my answer? h of x is continuous everywhere except x equal to pi plus 2 pi k pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, negative pi, and so on. So that there are points of discontinuity, and the points of discontinuity are occurring at these multiples of pi, because that's going to give us the log of 0, which is undefined. Okay, I will let you, let's take a look at, I'll let you graph this. We can discuss this in class next time. But make sure you graph and, and see what's happening at pi and 2 pi and 3 pi and so on. All right, I'm going to stop here, but I'm going to let you finish for class next time. I want you to go ahead and discuss the continuity of these last few problems that are up here, and we'll discuss the answers in class next time.